Okay, so I'm gonna wait just a second as everybody gets transferred in from their waiting room. Dr. Gundry, if you wanna hit um, slideshow at the top of your screen, it will put it into full screen mode. Perfect. Play from start, yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, so I just want to welcome everybody onto the webinar. Thanks for your patience. We had a couple of technical difficulties right before we got started. Um, so thanks everybody for joining us tonight. And um, you know, as we know, we have Dr. Stephen Gundry, who is um, just a, I guess, world renowned as far as um, you know, the nutrition and functional medicine community and. I want to welcome you, Dr. Gundry. Thank you for your time this evening and um, you know your your flexibility and everything getting this webinar up and running. Um, I was actually just going to give anybody who isn't familiar with um, Dr. Gundry um, just a little bit of background on him. Um, or even I can. <laughs> well, yeah, actually, that might be easier because I'm. Yeah. I just lost the screen where I had it. <laughs> I found it. Um, but yeah, if you would prefer to, you can go ahead and introduce yourself. Sure. Unaccustomed as I am to public speaking. So, <laughs> exactly. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Sorry for the, the glitch. We were, we were trying to get a really fascinating patient results uh, from Zoomer testing. And and uh, I, think, I think we're going to pull it off towards the end, but she's just absolutely illustrative of, I think, the power of these tests. So um, uh, I have been using Vibrant America uh, for most of our autoimmune work for, uh, actually, since their inception. And I was, I think, really one of the early adapters and one of the early adapters of the uh, Zoomer test. In fact, they created one for me, uh, the lectin zoomer that we'll talk about in a little bit. So a little bit of background, uh, I spent most of my career as professor and chairman of cardiothoracic surgery and pediatrics at Loma Linda University. And uh, real quickly, 20 years ago, I met a gentleman with inoperable coronary artery disease, who I call Big Ed in all my books, who reversed his coronary artery disease in six months with a diet and taking a bunch of supplements from the health food store. And I thought it was a rather remarkable accomplishment. And so I started experimenting with myself and with patients that I operated on and rapidly found that, uh, in fact, his experience was not an N of one, but was reproducible. So, uh, 20 years ago, I uh, resigned my position at Loma Linda and set up uh, an institute in Palm Springs and subsequently also in Santa Barbara, where every three months uh, I asked people to give me about 20, 20 vials of their blood and we sent it off to various labs, including Vibrant, looking at the impact of removing certain foods from people's diets and the impact of supplements. And uh, I published uh, my work in reputable journals like Circulation, the American Heart Association Journal. And I, I now have four New York Times bestselling books. The most famous is The Plant Paradox. And the most recent uh, is The Longevity Paradox. Uh, but when Vibrant uh, came out with the uh, food zoomers and the food sensitivities, uh, I have I have a published uh, taught a paper that I gave at the American Heart Association a year ago of uh, 102 patients with biomarker proven autoimmune disease, most of whom were on immunosuppressant drugs, who, who in time following my protocol, the plant paradox protocol, 94% of them were biomarker negative and off of their immunosuppressants. And we now have well over 500 in that category. The reason I mention that is, I have a number of patients who've been, oh gosh, five, seven different physicians, institutions, looking for why they 
have their particular autoimmune disease or why they have IBS or why they have irritable bowel. And uh, many of them eventually wind up in my office. And while uh, we have remarkable success with most of them, uh, there are a number of them that seemed to defy explanation. They did everything I asked them to do, and I thought I was asking them everything that they should do. And so when the, the Zoomers came out, and whoever from Vibrant thought of the marketing name Zoomer, uh, I got to talk to them. But anyhow, they're called Zoomers, and we get a good chuckle out, out of them when we order them. And let me say this, I, uh, Zoomers, uh, cost, can I mention cost, sir? Maybe I think so. so. I can't, or I should. Oh, no, no, you can. I said I didn't, I didn't think you did yet, though, but you, oh. you're welcome to, absolutely. So, Zoomers in general cost about $199 a piece, and correct, correct me if I'm wrong, and we've, we haven't found any insurance that'll pay for them, but and again, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Vibrant has a package deal that if you do for them, it's around $4.99. So let me say from the start that I have yet to regret ordering uh, Zoomers, and I have yet to have a patient that regretted, regretted Zoomers. And I must say, I order them more and more because quite frankly, I just don't regret the information they give. So with, with that in mind, uh, and hired gun, I'm being paid to tell you this, but I'm being to paid to tell you this, is because I have an extensive experience with this test, and they don't pay me to use this test. Darn it. So, <laughs> um, so uh, with that in mind, let's run through this. Again, they're called Zoomers, but one of the interesting things that uh, Zoomers do that Vibrant has done is all of us are, of course, aware of uh, amino acids and amino acids are uh, broken down in our gut by a pepsin into smaller peptides and those smaller peptides in turn are made of various proteins so what's different about the vibrant advantage is that they are actually doing uh, Food sensitivity, food sensitivity testing using whole proteins uh, or extracts so that antibody to antigen binding actually happens only in protein-based molecules. And luckily it doesn't occur with carbohydrates or lipids. So I think the problem of whole protein sensitivity testing, which most labs do, is limited to testing water-soluble portions of proteins, which actually leaves out peptides or protein fragments. So for instance, one of the gluten molecules, gliadin, is not water soluble. So you would actually never pick up that sensitivity. Now, peptide level testing in the small intestine, like I mentioned, these larger peptides are broken into smaller peptides, and then the smaller peptides into amino acids. So the peptide level testing could, in incorrectly identify aberrant immune responses as foreign proteins that the immune system will react to. Now this largely occurs when intestinal permeability is present, but not under normal circumstances. So there's something to be said for both, but uh, as, you, as you'll see, you may have a non-leaky gut and yet get false reactions that you react to something when in fact your gut is perfectly capable of not letting these larger peptides in. Okay, uh, so I think these uh, peptides are the, is the purest form of antigen presentation which cannot be 
be achieved at your protein level. And I think that's where uh, Vibrant America has, has leaped above uh, other folks. I quite frankly am not impressed with most food sensitivity testing that I've seen from very reputable famous labs. In fact, I don't use those labs anymore and I have an impact in the past because I just haven't been impressed. Now food zoomers are their most recent innovation in testing peptide level reactivity to highly processed foods, uh, to wheat, corn, dairy, egg, peanut, lectins, and aquaporins. And I, I'm going to have a field day with aquaporins because I've actually been taught something by Vibrant that uh, I didn't know and explains a great deal, at least to me. Uh, seafood, soy, and nuts. Now, you don't have to test all of these. In fact, I'm usually very specific, but I'll tell you the ones I routinely do, and then we'll go from there. So um, I'm, I think I've kind of already said this, but if you look at, for instance, raw versus cooked, it turns out cooking food won't uh, affect the accuracy of these results. So uh, whole proteins could be broken down into peptides and we'll actually, Vibrant America will pick it up. Uh, other, other foods might not. And again, in terms of digestive insufficiency, as most of us know, there should be no whole proteins present in the small intestine. And these whole proteins should definitely not be able to fit through tight junctions. But uh, multiple antibodies to reactive foods are possibly more an indication of insufficient digestive function, whether it's you know, low acid, achloridria, or insufficient digestive enzymes. And there are some recommendations that come with these tests as to how to tell the difference. Okay, so what I usually start with, with almost everyone, in fact, everyone, is the wheat zoomer. Now, here's what's fascinating to me, and I suspected this, but I wouldn't guessed it. Um, when I wrote The Plant Paradox, uh, a reference to paper, of people with uh, biopsy-proven celiac disease, which is still the gold standard, it's not done much anymore. And we're putting on, on a gluten-free diet for uh, 18 months. And they were then re-biopsied. And 70% of these people who were eating gluten-free we're still positive for celiac disease at the end of a uh, year and a half. And I think that's a perhaps startling finding. It really does, didn't surprise me because gluten happens to be a lectin and other lectins, which we'll talk about, are at least as mischievous. But what's the startling thing that Vibrant America does is that so far, uh, a hundred percent of people who claim to be avid gluten-free eaters have one or more markers of gluten or non-gluten wheat proteins in their wheat zoomer. And multiple of them have wheat germ agglutinin, which cannot uh, be found except in whole wheat, and uh, multiple of them have all the other wheat proteins, and we'll show you those in a little bit. So they also do test for the standard markers of which you see on the second line. Uh, they will test for zonulin, but more importantly, I think their tests for anti-zonulin and anti-actin are even more illustrative of leaky gut. I see a number of people who test negative for zonulin, but are almost always positive for anti-zonulin and anti-actin. Uh, zonulin uh, obviously is the switch that gluten and lectins uh, 
kern, which in turn hits a receptor on the enterocyte that then breaks the tight junction and actin is part of that tight junction. And so both of those proteins should not be present in, past the barrier of the gut wall. They should never appear. And so when anti-zonulin and anti-actin is present, it basically means the tight junctions have been broken and they've been broken by zonulin and both of those proteins have leaked uh, into the interstitium. Now, uh, as I've written a lot about lipopolysaccharides, LPSs, which uh, I don't swear, but I can't help it, I call them little pieces of shit because uh, that's what they are. These are bacterial cell walls. And these cell walls, uh, our immune system literally uses TLR receptors, toll-like receptors, to scan for protein or uh, carbohydrate protein barcodes. And they read the barcode on LPSs as a living bacteria. In fact, most of you probably know that we can inject uh, LPSs into healthy volunteers. Uh, these are dead pieces of bacterial cell walls, and they will go into septic shock, uh, despite the fact of uh, no uh, bacteria, living bacteria present. So LPS is a major uh, stimulant of Immune, uh, immune system activation of inflammation. I've referenced papers where LPSs can be found in arthritic joints in the fluid. So uh, LPSs can get into circulation in two ways. They absolutely can leak through a leaky gut, but uh, they can also travel on chylomicrons which is the major transport system for uh, not only saturated fats, uh, but also, interestingly enough, for uh, olive oil. The uh, exception is that uh, MCT oil, medium chain triglycerides, do not get absorbed by a chylomicrons, interesting. And uh, fish oil is actually fairly impressive in its ability to prevent LPSs from you know, bridging the gut wall on chylomicrons. So with that ado, I realize that this slide is in here, um, but that gives you a nice little summary of basically what I just said. Uh, serpent is another non-gluten wheat protein, which is a no novel target antigen in celiac disease. And I would say that, uh, approximately, don't hold me to this, 80% of people with wheat sensitivity uh, clearly react to the non-gluten components uh, in, in wheat as well as gluten. So why should we be interested in this? Well, I've, uh, I was aware of this data when I started researching lectins, and there is, and uh, why did I get interested in autoimmune disease? Um, about 70% of my patients I now see with autoimmune disease. I was a transplant immunologist at Loma Linda. I, my job was to fool the immune system and pretty good at it. And first read my first book long ago, Dr. Kendry's Diet Evolution, people with autoimmune diseases showed up in my office and said, what do you know about autoimmune disease? I said, I know absolutely nothing about it, but I know a whole lot about the immune system. And if you want to play, let's play. And that's actually how we got started. So uh, what happens is I like the theory of molecular mimicry as the cause of autoimmune disease. And that theory, as far as I know, was first proposed um, out of uh, the paleo diet long ago. And the idea is that since the immune system looks for molecular barcodes, there are similar uh, molecular structures on 
of plant proteins, particularly lectins, that mimic other proteins in our body. And that we basically uh, fool ourselves. Some people call it friendly fire. Or some people call it a, a, a case of mistaken identity. But there's a significant number of papers, many of them recent, that actually associate uh, very strong ANAs and anti-ENA measurements in patients with celiac disease, as you see in the middle one. And notice that uh, there's a very strong correlation between both ANAs and ANAs in Zoomer positive patients and in non wheat sensitivity patients. So, you know, up to um, 20, 30% of these people will have uh, autoantibodies. Same sort of thing appears in rheumatoid arthritis. Um, there's very strong correlation between the wheat zoomer and CD positive celiac disease folks and non wheat sensitivity. Not quite so much, but clearly very strong correlation. Uh, sorry. So uh, I'm going to show you, hopefully, at the end, what one of these tests actually look like and take you through uh, where we went with an actual living patient who recently came to see me about this time last year. And you'll see what happens. It actually shocked her husband. Now, I think one of the things is uh, the corn zoomer. And the corn zoomer uh, looks for these proteins family. And the, they also look for a protein specific to GMO corn. It's called corn cry protein. And if you think about eating GMO corn, it makes you cry. So what I want to really bring your attention to is this corn wheat overlap epitope. And simplistically, and actually realistically, and I think I have a slide for it. Okay. So here's a, this is this is actually one of the I'm going to show you. Uh, this is a woman who was diagnosed with celiac disease. She's 75 years old. She was diagnosed with celiac disease a number of years ago, and she's been eating a gluten-free diet. Uh, and she, quite frankly, wasn't getting any better. She had horrible intestinal issues. She was actually quite depressed, probably had some wonderful brain fog. She visited a bunch of centers, including the Mayo Clinic Rochester, who with her HLA testing for uh, the gluten genes, they told her she couldn't possibly have celiac disease because she isn't positive for the genes, which uh, I can assure you, at least in my experience, that while, while those uh, mutations do potentiate uh, having gluten sensitivity, you do not need them to have celiac disease, as so many of my patients have, as was she. So we, the first thing we did on her was get all these Zoomers. And you'll see in the little while um, what her wheat Zoomer looked like. But the next thing we did was her corn zoomer. And it's, as most of us know, it's probably the most commonly consumed alternative grain on a gluten-free diet. And it's used everywhere. As most of you know, about 75, 79% of all the carbon molecules in us Americans come from corn. Uh, as opposed to Europeans, where only 5% of their carbon molecules come from corn. So uh, it's everywhere. Now, here's, here's the troublemaker, in my opinion. So an epitope is part of an antigen that's recognized by the immune system. And the epitope is where the antibody binds. Now, corn actually has overlapping peptides with wheat. And so this is actually where these peptides overlap. And you can see the remarkable, actually, similarities to so many of corn with the alpha-zine and alpha-gladin 
in wheat. And so what happens is that these people react to corn as if they were eating wheat. And this lady was actually a perfect example of this. And she was literally living on a corn diet. She thought that cornbread muffins would be fabulous, that corn chips was her best friend, that uh, corn on the cob. And so when we'll show you, she saw that she reacted to almost every protein in corn. Uh, we had a sudden clue as to why this woman wasn't getting any better on a gluten-free diet. Uh, this is this wonderful cry protein in corn, in GMO corn. And I'm, I'm going to take a look at this because we're going to mention this again when we get to the lectin zoomers. So cry proteins kill insects when you eat, eat them. And they actually form pores in the gastrointestinal tract of the insect. And that causes water and cations to enter. This leads to swelling and lysis, resulting in death of the insect. Pretty doggone good. Uh, smart idea. The only problem is that uh, Quebec found that they probably don't get digested. And it's been found in the blood of women and pregnant women and umbilical cords. It can cause eye irritation, swelling, and even blindness. But if this is what it does to insects to kill them, uh, that's another dumb way of saying leaky gut. And so GMO corn is everywhere. And it may be one of those really unheralded reasons why we're getting more and more and more leaky gut besides glyphosate. Okay, um, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, except uh, Zine is the major storage protein of corn. It has gluten-like characteristics. So deaminated peptides can bind to the HLA DQ plan, HLA DQ8 to elicit, it, elicit a response that resembles gluten. So uh, get the corn zine and you'll shock a number of your patients. Particularly if they have this epitope, the wheat corn epitope, that really nails it that they absolutely can't have corn. Okay, uh, one of my favorite subjects is casein A1. These are actually the markers measured uh, in the uh, milk zoomer. And this one's been a real eye-opener to me. I have preached that casein A1 is evil, and I will talk about that here. So casein is 80% of all the protein in milk, and those are the different types of casein. Weighs about 20%. The interesting thing about casein A1, I think it's on the next slide, Yes. So um, alpha, so down below uh, A1 beta casein and islet cell overlap. Uh, cow's milk has been strongly implicated in autoimmune type 1 diabetes mellitus. We have a few children and young adults who luckily we've stopped the progression um, by removing uh, casein A1 milk from them. And so I've seen it in my own practice. Uh, there's a recent Chinese study, I don't think it's published yet, that's going to show that there's a big difference between the A2 milk uh, drinkers in China and A1 milk drinkers in China and diabetes, type 1 diabetes. Uh, these uh, lactoferrin, as you know, is involved in regulation of iron absorption in the bowel. It's actually probably pretty good. It's got antiviral activity, and we think it's very important in the development of the early immune system. Uh, uh, Eutrophin is a, a milk fat soluble membrane. Hang on, I'm looking for my slide. There it is. So 
you probably know that Holstein cows uh, had a genetic mutation that they started making uh, casein A1 or beta. Don't continue. Holstein or heart. You it's everywhere. Now, the problem with blood tests for peanut sensitivity is they're looking to IgG and IgA antibodies to peanut extract. And I found that it just does not correlate very well with patient symptoms. What Vibrant does is offer a peptide level antibody detection to all of these antigens, including recently discovered antigenic peptides. So to me, it's just a better dive if you're looking for that. Now here's one of my favorite tests, and I'm gonna spend more time, obviously you're gonna, I'm gonna tell you that lectins are evil, but um, lectins are primarily in the nightshade families, peanuts, uh, but so here's, here's the lectins that they test for in the lectin zoomer. And obviously the bean family, uh, barley, chickpea, peas, there's tomato, there are lectins in corn, there are lectins in peanuts, there are lectins in rice, lentils, potatoes, cucumbers, and kidney beans. Now, um, some of my patients uh, literally, it, they could have written the book when we do a lectin zoomer, because every one of these is present. But I want to spend your time on something that I would not know except for Vibrant America, and I've become fascinated with this. So aquaporins. Um, aquaporins are control water channel openings, uh, particularly for plants. Uh, think about this. If it's a really hot day, like most of America has been for the last uh, weekend, uh, plants respire, they breathe, and they often breathe out water vapor, and they have little pores in their leaves that open and close depending on how much water they want to breathe out, and they also bring water up through the roots by opening up channels that are controlled by aquaporins. Now what's so fascinating is that humans have aquaporins, to control water movement in and out of the intestine. And they have aquaporins that control uh, flow of water in and out of the brain at the blood-brain barrier. Now, there are aquaporins in bell pepper, spinach, corn, tobacco, potato, tomato, and soybeans that I think the next slide will show this. Yeah, uh, actually, we're gonna go back. We're gonna go forward. So you can actually, uh, where is it? Uh, there it is. So here's these water channel proteins. So we have these in our brain and they, aquaporin four is the most prevalent aquaporin in the human CNS. Food aquaporins show structural similarity to aquaporin-4. So the antibodies against food aquaporins can be cross-reactive to human aquaporin-4 and cause neuroautoimmunity. Now, I've had a number of patients who we couldn't figure out why they were doing what they were doing, who had brain fog. And three women in specific had uh, reactivity to spinach aquaporins. And just coincidentally, uh, they were incredible high spinach eaters, spinach smoothies, spinach salads. And two out of the three of them were positive for leaky brain. The third one uh, has a cerebellar antibody on the Vibrant America Neurozoomer. And she was diagnosed as atypical Parkinson's. 
And she came to me because she wasn't getting any better. And I'm pretty sure we figured out where her atypical Parkinson's coming from, all thanks to this aquaporin test that Vibrant America has developed. And uh, I'm, I'm now quite suspect that, well, I can tell you that spinach will probably be soon leaving, me, leaving my recommended foods and makes me cry. But I think this is a real advance in a whole other area of leaky gut. And there's some actually very good papers written about that aquaporin cross-reactivity can cause leaky gut by opening these water channels. So if you learn nothing else today, uh, please remember that. Uh, nut zoomers. I don't use the nut zoomer, um, but I think the nut zoomer, particularly again where we're scratching our heads, this is the markers that are measured. Uh, I will call your attention to why I don't use the nut zoomer because almonds carry of antigens, particularly in the peel. Cashews, as you know, are not nuts at all, and the dermatologic literature is full of how dangerous they are in terms of their uh, irritable and inflammatory potential. Uh, certainly, most people that I see already know they have a walnut allergy. Uh, not too many people eat a lot of Brazil nuts, so I don't test for that. But I think uh, almonds are important. I let people have peeled almonds like Marcona almonds. Uh, interestingly, Spanish mothers teach their daughters how to cook almonds to remove the peel because the peels are dead. Um, the cashew ANA01 is a major, major cashew antigen. By the way, it's resistant to heat, thus food processing methods have very little effect. So please get rid of your cashew butter and your cashew milk. And interestingly enough, it has a very similar, uh, Similarity to peanut. Uh, seafood zoomer. Uh, I'll use this. Most people know they have a shellfish an an allergy, but we have a number of people who uh, I think this is useful for. I don't use it personally very much, but it tests for pretty much uh, all the the major fish that people are going to be going to be eating. Uh, so. 25 different seafoods, different subspecies at a peptide level. And when you get scores, uh, the patient is given a very, very large, almost 80-page uh, booklet. I find it's a lot easier, as I'll show you in a minute, to break this down into summary pages and uh, make it easier for the patient to understand. But the nice thing about vibrant wellness is whenever something is positive, they will actually explain the good thing about oysters, but also uh, the bad things about them and wh whether they might cross-react to other things. Uh, this actually looks for an interesting parasitic worm that is in a lot of uh, fish and shellfish and can cause an allergic reaction. As far as I know, I think Vibrant is the only one that actually looks for this as the cause for a seafood uh, allergy or reactivity. Uh, I'm not gonna bore you with that because I want to show this. There is a soy zoomer. I don't utilize the soy zoomer because they're, they're banned uh, from anyone's diet. But if you've got a a vegetarian who is will not give it up, I think a soy zoomer is a, a very useful test. Um, it's um, soy is mischievous, so I'll, I'll just kind of leave it at that. The other problem is the cry A1 GMO protein. Uh, interestingly enough, there's that cry protein. And it's, since most soy in the United States is GMO, 
uh, you're going to probably get the same reaction to this as you get from the corn cry protein. Okay, uh, food sensitivity. Again, I think the difference that Vibrant America brings to this is testing at the extract level. So this is when you order the food sensitivity panel, and I do use this panel, you're going to get tide level sensitivity to these compounds rather than a water extract. And it keeps going and going and going and going. Uh, and this is everything they, they test for. And I won't bore you with that. You can see it. Okay. Uh, now, Sarah, do you think we can serve up that, uh, my sli the slides that you got for me? Here we go. Yay, thank you. Uh, now, Sarah, are you gonna control that? If you're still on. Okay, uh, if you're not, I think this will be in order. So this is a 75 year old woman that I told you about before. Uh, diagnosed with celiac uh, for many years, put on a gluten-free diet, uh, really wasn't better. Intense abdominal pain, cramps, fatigue, uh, brain fog. Her husband, who loves her dearly, really had classified her as a nut. Uh, and he says this to her face. Uh, I've gotten to know, know them quite well. And to his benefit, he's come uh, to all the testing. Now, this is the wheat zoomer, and I'm going to just show you a few pages. And so here's her intestinal permeability pattern. Now, the first thing you'll notice is her zonulin is actually in the control range. And you go, well, she doesn't have intestinal permeability. Her anti-zonulin uh, is normal, but her anti-actin was actually really high. So that's not supposed to be there. So she has leaky gut. Now you'll notice she's not leaking LPSs. She actually eats a quite a low fat diet. Now, uh, Sarah, can you hit the next? One. Thank you. So this is a woman who does not eat gluten. And imagine her surprise when her Galadin panel, as you can see, uh, there's Galadin in her despite not eating gluten and telling all the restaurants she goes to that she has to be gluten free. Now I I am friends with a number of James Beard awarding chefs and restaurateurs, and I can tell you that to a person, to a man or a woman, they will tell you that it is impossible to eat gluten-free in a restaurant. And I won't bore you with why that is, but they, every one of them has laughed in my face that it would be so completely impractical for them to have a gluten-free restaurant that they will not do it and cannot do it. So. Uh, I've told all my patients, if you eat out in restaurants, the odds are you are going to get gluten in your food. Uh, Sarah, how about the next one? So she was shocked. Here's her non-gluten wheat panel. And she was shocked. And here is that serpent. And she, there it is. And so she also reacts to the amylase prote protease inhibitors which are present in wheat. And actually, they're present in all grains. So all of these uh, are in her, despite the fact that she was gluten-free. And her, she was shocked, her husband was shocked. Sarah, next picture. So here's the one. Uh, actually, this is a little out of order, but that's fine. So here she is with the lectin zoomer. And so she reacts to the lectins in potatoes and tomatoes. But what got my attention was that she reacts to the potato aquaporin. So she loves French fries and of course they're gluten-free. So this was a woman who was living on corn chips and French fries and this in and of itself, now, the other things obviously were causing leaky gut, but this in, in and of itself could have been one of the culprits in her leaky gut. 
and in her brain fog. Uh, so that was a real shocker to her. Uh, next one, Sarah, I hope the corn zoomer is on there. Yes, thank you. Okay, here's the one that blew her away. Look at the corn wheat overlap. IgA, IgG. So every, and she was living on corn, like I mentioned. So every time she was eating corn, she, her immune system thought she was eating wheat. And this light bulbs went out in her head when she saw this. And so the first thing that happened was her husband turned to me and he said, you mean she's not crazy? And she, she, you know, she got tears in her eyes. And she said, what, why, why didn't anybody tell me this? I said, well, because they didn't have the tools to tell you this. It's not their fault. This is such amazing technology that you can see that your lifestyle and being gluten-free was actually, in a way, making you worse. And number two, uh, you were still getting gluten in your diet. So uh, let's go to the next. We went three months. And now here's, this is kind of the first page you'll see in a wheat zoomer. And her previous result, uh, you get a score. She, she was positive and her intestinal permeability was positive. And lo and behold, now her scores are negative. And uh, this is kind of the summary slide, but now her everything, her gluten panel's negative, her gluten panel's negative, her non-gluten wheat panel is negative. She's negative for all the things, there's her anti-actin, she's negative. So they're all gone now. And needless to say, her symptoms are, you know, pretty much gone. Uh, let's see what we got on the next slide, Sarah. I think that was it. Oh, no. was that, okay. Oh, so that's that the final one. Uh, okay, yeah. So we were, there's a middle one, which is really kind of fun because in the middle one, so we've done this now three times. The middle one, she still had uh, a little anti-actin. She had one non-gluten peptide reactivity. All of her other gladins were now negative. And she was feeling great. And so we said, okay, we're going to do a few more uh, manipulations with sealing her gut and she's going to be very cautious and so we just did th that last this test right here in, at the end of May in this year and everything's negative and she she's now you know she's 75 years old she says this is the first time in my life I've actually felt normal and you know her husband you know just sits there and she says this is amazing you know I love her dearly. We've been married for, you know, like 40 years. And I just thought she was a ditz and a nut. And this is amazing. It wasn't in her head. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> he just sat there shaking his head. Um, so this is, I think, the power that Vibrant America's new testing can bring to, number one, a patient who doesn't make sense. Number two, a patient who uh, swears they're gluten-free, they're not. Uh, let me just say, add another fascinating anecdote. Uh, I recently started seeing a patient from LA who um, is so sensitive to everything. Uh, she has to wear gloves. She basically can't leave the, leave the house. Her, she swears that she's gluten-free, everything free. And when we first did her uh, wheat zoomer, there was gluten in her, including wheat germa gluten, and very marked intestinal permeability. And she said, that's impossible. I do not eat gluten. I do not come near wheat. And I said, well, do you go out to eat? Nope, I do not go out to eat because I know I can't eat out. You know, I can't even leave the house. And I said, uh, what about your husband? Does he eat wheat? 
And she said, oh yeah, he won't change. And I said, uh, do you cook breakfast? And she said, oh yeah, I cook breakfast for myself and my husband. I said, what does your husband eat for breakfast? And she says, well, I always toast him a whole wheat English muffin to have with his two eggs. And I said, uh, do you put the English muffins in the toaster? She said, yeah. I said, do you take them out of the toaster? She said, yeah, what are you saying? I said, well, you just contaminated yourself with whole wheat and gluten. And her, her mouth dropped. She said, what? I said, you, you got enough on your hands on your gloves to contaminate yourself. And so that, that test was able to kind of get through to her that, um, you know, her making her husband's breakfast was, was a part of the problem. And uh, we're actually making actually really good progress with her now. She obviously doesn't make her husband's breakfast and that's banned from the house. But that's the sort of thing, uh, those are the sort of people I see now that uh, are kind of at wit's end. And this, these tests have really opened my eye to most people who are eating gluten-free have gluten in them, number one. And probably 70% of people cross-react to corn uh, with that, at least in my practice. And I will, I will ha have you start thinking about spinach in another way. So uh, that pretty much uh, sums it up. I'm happy to answer any questions. And if you want to sign off, it's probably getting late. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for listening. Uh, Dr. Henry, I have, yeah. have just a minute to, um, I think we had one question that came through. Um, if you have a, just a minute or two. Yeah, we'll, yeah, yeah, I'm happy to, we'll go as long as anybody wants to. Sure, sure. Um, so Kathleen commented, if someone's secretory IgA is not detectable, how useful are these panels and what do you do to increase SIGA? That's a great question. And um, this actually particular lady had very low uh, IgA and I think IgG, don't quote me on that. And within the first retest, both her IgA and IgG had returned into the normal level and uh, have stayed normal. I, I think part of, my, in my simplistic viewpoint, years and years ago, I noticed that a great number of people with uh, IBS, um, with interesting physiologic issues, had low white blood cell counts in the twos and threes. And some of them had, had undergone extensive testing for this. And kind of putting on my transplant immunology hat, I. I felt that uh, uh, white blood cells were being marginalized uh, going after uh, foreign antigens. And I had nothing to prove for it except in my transplant experience. And uh, I'm convinced that if you see somebody with uh, a white blood cell count of three, uh, that they almost certainly have underlying leaky gut and other uh, presentations. And interestingly enough, uh, when my patients seal their gut, usually their white blood cell count uh, returns into a normal range. And I think that's the same thing that's happening with these immunoglobulins. I think they're being kind of rapidly consumed and the knock on wood for the most part return to normal. Great. Thank you. Um, let's see. We have one, oh, let's see, we have a comment. Do you find pinto bean consumption showing up under kidney bean on the tests? Yeah, you know, I, they, I think all beans, um, I mean, even my most fervent detractors will admit that beans have lectins. Uh, it's true, and I passed by that slide, you can definitely mitigate lectins by 
repeatedly soaking and rinsing beans. Uh, I study extensively uh, cuisines that eat beans, and I can tell you that they're fastidious about soaking their beans, usually for 48 hours, and changing the water every four to six hours, throwing it out, putting a new one in. And then they, quite frankly, slow cook their beans for an extended period of time. And I think traditional cultures have learned that this is what you're supposed to do. Uh, so I think all beans uh, are mischievous, but with traditional methods, uh, with pressure cooking, you can mitigate uh, against, I think, the effect of lectins. Uh, there, you can't uh, get rid of gluten with a pressure cooker. Uh, several of my patients have tried for over an hour of pressure cooking and they still react to them. And there's one, there's one paper it's buried in my computer somewhere that does say that lectin, the gluten, lectin, the delayed and can't be broken under high pressure and high heat. Oh, by the way, the Adventists, where you know I lived for most of my career, their mystery meat is texturized vegetable protein, which is a soy flour that's been extruded under high pressure and high heat. So interestingly enough. Uh, they wittingly or unwittingly detoxified the lectin in soy. Um, and just to clarify, James, um, I'm not sure if you meant that somebody consuming pinto beans would come up positive for kidney beans. Um, so back in the beginning when no, Dr. Sorry. No, it's okay. I just, I wasn't sure which he was asking, but I wanted to clarify. Um, when Dr. Gundry was talking about the difference between peptide and extract level, these peptide level tests, um, basically one of the strengths of them is they eliminate the possibility of cross-reactivity because we're testing for thousands of peptides in each of the foods. Um, so pinto beans and kidney beans at, at the extract level are similar enough that you might see them confused on a food sensitivity test but on the food zoomer, they would not be. It's very, very specific for kidney beans and pinto beans. So that would not be the case on the lectin zoomer. Um, on food sensitivity testing in general, that might happen though. Um, so hopefully that clarifies. Yeah, that's what's so great about your test. It, it literally takes all these sensitivities to an, another level where, mm -hmm. where probably they, they should be. Right, right. Uh, let's see, uh, Yvonne asked, what are your favorite supplements you use for restoring leaky gut? Well, I'll put in a shameless plug. I make a product called Total Restore from Gundry MD. And I think it's actually my second biggest seller because it, it works pretty doggone good. I spend a lot of time on this with my patients. And uh, so that's my shameless plug. But uh, I'll, I'll take away one of the things that I think most leaky gut protocols miss is, you know, there's a lot of good things to throw down, like L-glutamine, just as an example, and marshmallow root, and, uh, just as an example. But uh, I use the example on all my patients that if, you, if we're out in a rowboat and, on a lake and we spring a leak in the bottom of the boat, we have two options. One is to grab a bucket and start bailing. And if the hole gets bigger, if we have multiple holes, we're going to need a bigger bucket. And I think that most leaky gut protocols are aimed at giving some people buckets to bail with. So what if lectins are a major cause of leaky gut, and I certainly think there's ample evidence that Fiber in America is provided because, again, gluten is a lectin, then it's a lot easier to put your finger in the dike, in the hole, and stop the leak from coming in. And then your bucket will work really well. So I think the start is using something like Vibrant America to identify the culprits that are causing the holes, the leaky gut, get those culprits out and then, you know, institute therapy in terms of supplements. Uh, 
Does that clarify things? I hope. I think so. Yeah, that made sense. Um, let's see. And that's what's so amazing about this test. And again, you, Library in America has taught me so much. And if anybody knows me, uh, I, if I'm not learning something new every day, I might as well hang it up. Um, I see physicians in nutrition who have not changed their recommendations in 20 years, uh, despite the you know, immense amount of knowledge we've learned. And I've certainly changed my recommendations based on uh, Vibrant America Zoomers. I mean, it's just been right, right. eye-opening. Um, let's see, there's one other question. Let's see. Um, so Dr. Advani um, had questions about the lectins. Is it on raw lectin or cooked lectins? And I think you covered that as far as the whole it, it doesn't really matter because it's peptide level, but did you want to go over that one more time or? Yeah, it really doesn't matter. Uh, because this is the peptide level, it will, it will pick up uh, these lectins. Now, having said that, um, just to be clear, there, there really are lectins in, in almost all plants. Uh, they are a, a major part of the plant defense system. And interesting, uh, bitter vegetables, particularly the cruciferous family, there are many people who believe the bitterness is actually there to warn the predator that he's probably making a mistake in eating this and is probably gonna pay for it. Uh, which makes sense because if an animal takes one bite of your leaf and then decides not to eat you, it's a whole lot better than eating the whole plant and then deciding not to eat you. Uh, so I, I see a number of people who, particularly with leaky gut and interval bowel, where they try early on to introduce a lot of raw, particularly cruciferous vegetables, uh, like kale, like arugula, and it literally tears them up. And particularly if they put them in a smoothie, they've really homogenized all these proteins and made them much more uh, accessible to stimulate the wall of the gut. So with my folks with, with leaky gut and with IBS, I, I really kind of go, I really try to not use the cruciferous family early on, or if they're going to do it, they basically have to nuke it in a pressure cooker to mush. And some people will still react to it. I'd much rather start them with yams and jicama and uh, taro root and yucca as kind of the starting point. But that's just years of doing this now. Great, um, so we have to wrap it up because we're, we're kind of at that hour point. Um, but Dr. Gundry, I wanted to thank you, um, you know, deeply for your time. That was an excellent walkthrough of the Zoomers. And then your case study was, was incredibly informative. Um, I did want to throw out for, for those providers that are newer to the Zoomers or haven't run them yet in your practice. Um, so Dr. Gundry did kind of briefly touch on price, but I did want to remind everybody that with the food Zoomers, and that's the, the peptide level tests, when you order four or more, they are $100 each. So instead of each being $199, they're $100. So you know, four Zoomers is, is $400, five is $500, and so forth. When you run a Zoomer bundle, we throw in either food sensitivity one or food sensitivity two. You can choose between one of those panels. Um, so if you haven't ordered one of the Zoomer bundles and you have patients that you're kind of you know, thinking that this might be appropriate. So Dr. Gundry, you know, mentioned a few of the situations, people with neurological symptoms, you know, the lectin and aquaporin zoomers, very relevant. People who claim to have gone gluten-free, but they're still symptomatic, you know, consider the corn zoomer as well as the wheat zoomer, obviously. Um, I just want to, again, thank you, Dr. Gundry, for your time tonight. And thank you, everybody else who logged in and stuck around and listened, and, and hopefully we answered some questions. If you do have additional questions that we weren't able to get through, um, please feel free to email those to me. 
um, and I can try to get you answers um, either from our clinical team um, or, you know, we, we, and also the slides will be available once the recording is posted to our portal. And so some of your questions are also um, can be answered by some of the information on the slides. Um, so anyway, Dr. Henry, if that's, did you have anything else you wanted to throw out there or um, how can people find your books, your website? Do you want to give any? Yeah, so you can go to drgundry.com. I have a two YouTube channels. I've got podcasts every week, the Dr. Gundry podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. We have uh, usually pretty interesting guests that I think you'll enjoy. Um, so you can also, my supplement is at GundryMD.com. Uh, happy to send your patients over there. And uh, if they don't like the product, they send it back or send empty jars back and they get a full refund. That's how much uh, I believe in this. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Have a great evening.